what inspired uh, National Geographic to kind of take on population in a big way? Well, you know, I think it was the the milestone, the fact that the UN is projecting that the global population is going to cross 7 billion uh, late late this year. Uh, and we're covering, as you know, and global environmental issues all the time. Uh, but this it, it but this was an occasion to take a fresh look at it. And I guess the other thing is we get, as you probably do also, a lot of reader mail uh, from sort of on a regular basis whenever we cover some environmental topic from readers who say, wait a minute, when are you going to tackle the real problem? The real problem is there are just too darn many people in the world and why are you all not facing up to it? And so we thought this was a good occasion to face up to it. Fred Pierce wrote a book that came out last year on the coming population crash. And right. The, the, the kind of the meme that was popular out there for a while was that it's over. If anything, we're all going to age and, uh, and, uh, and shrivel away as a species in the next <laughs> few, few generations. And, and, right. and that has implications for the economy and that kind of thing. What, what was your sense uh, after probing this issue for a while? Well, uh, I came at it fairly fresh. I had never written about population before. And so I, I approached it as someone who had heard, f- had the sense that I w- I'd, been he- I'd been hearing about, uh, as all us baby boomers had been, about the population explosion all our lives. Um, but, but yeah, hearing these sort of conflicting uh, tales. And what I came, and so I, I was really interested just to look into it and to talk to talk to the scientists who study population about it. As a, it, it, I started out wanting to treat it just as a science problem. As Like you, I come from a science journalism background, and so I, I set out to find some of these people. And um, what I came away with was an understanding that there is no one population story. There are these, it's, we live in incredibly interesting times. There, there are these two conflicting stories uh, going on. They're, they're, the population boom is still going on worldwide, and there are countries that are still suffering from the immediacy of, 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 of that. But then there are other countries that have, like Europe and most of the developed countries, that have come out the other side. And so uh, using it, but, but it turns out there's one scheme that demographers use that sort of makes sense of all this, this, this idea of the demographic transition. And uh, that's what I tried to get across in the article. That, we're, that the countries are all going through a similar evolution, uh, but at different, different time periods. Early on in Dot Earth, I did a piece called The Population Cluster Bomb that basically <laughs> saw the world as um, the impacts of population growth and the phenomenon is ultimately local, really, even though in the 60s there was this concept of the global population explosion. But... And that, that piece showed that, as Jesse Osabel put it from Rockefeller University, yeah. there are imploders and exploders. Right. And, and what that creates is a lot of flow or potential flow and like immigration. And, and I think you dealt a little bit with that aspect. Uh, one, one of the interviews that, that didn't make it into the piece was with a demographer in, uh, in Kerala in southern India. And I'd spent a couple of days with this guy and he'd helped arrange some interviews and uh, talking about the particular situation of, of Kerala, which is the state on the southwest coast of India that is already uh, at below replacement fertility. In other words, the women there are not having enough babies to reproduce the population. Which, um, but at the end of it, I asked him to talk about India more generally, and, and he was very he was surprisingly negative about the situation in his own state. But uh, when I asked him about India in general, was he not concerned about the growing population of his country? He said, "No, India, it's no problem. You know, we're gonna we're, we're, we have the resources. We're gonna we're gonna help everyone else out of our problem. In other words, Italy needs a hundred thousand workers. We can send them next year." One of my readers wrote to Stephen Salmoni. Uh, who's one of the frequent posters, a very passionate one on the population issue, recently mm-hmm. posed the question in a comment, uh, is, the, is the demographic transition a given? Is it essentially an established hypothesis that's you know got the, the weight of theory in the scientific sense? Or could we end up uh, going way past um, things at some point mid-century? Um, is there yeah. still a surprise I- is, that could happen? That's a really interesting question, and I think I think what he's getting at is that the the demographic transition is an empirical phenomenon that has been observed consistently now in a lot of countries. Um, but there is really demographers do not have a, 
a real scientific theory that would allow them to predict the future of population. And, and in particular, they can't pre predict human fertility. They can't predict how many babies people are going to have. There's no formula in which, you know, like a physics formula where they say, okay, well, if uh, GDP is this and if, uh, you know, the educational level of women is, is, is that, then, you know, then the number of babies will be such and such. So uh, all they, what they, but what they have is experience with a lot of countries. One of the things I was really trying to do is put this very emotional debate in a historical context and to show just how, just how old is the tradition of being scared about population, how, the, how apocalyptic thinking has been part of demography from the start. I mean, how people sort of, population became sort of a substitute when, 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 when scientific types stopped believing in, in, in you know, Armageddon, uh, population started to fulfill that role, the, the idea that the, the, the grow, human numbers themselves would bring about the end of the world. And, and so I, I think uh, learning about, and, and learning about the, the history of it, and, uh, it was, was, for me, one of the most, most interesting aspects. It's sort of a way of countering the, the emotions that we all have when we, when we face this issue, when we see our, our own little patch getting increasingly crowded. Yeah, it's fascinating too. And looking at it this for such a long time, I still um, um, have this um, uncertainty myself about the the Wiley Coyote question, as I put it on the blog. Where uh, are are we over the cliff and just haven't looked down yet, or um, will yeah. innovation and technology keep kind of threading the needle for us? Yeah, and you know, there is no. I don't think there's an answer to that question. What I what I've come to the conclusion is that there are sort of we have the people have sort of personality types that 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 uh, affect how they. Um, where they come down on that, we we can't really foresee the the future. And so, uh, I look at the past and see that we've managed to come come through <laughs> up to now. It is, I mean, it is interesting that the f the the previous forecasts of of doom that right when they happened that there there's been some development you know development that 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 pushed it away. That uh, when Malthus said predicted mass famines for the first time, chemical fertilizers were invented a decade later, and the smallpox vaccine right at the same time. And yeah. uh, so that, 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 that leaves me on the side of the optimist, that sort of historical perspective, but no one can know for sure. <laughs>